All right, welcome to Ponce Church this morning. Praise the Lord. All right, you know what a boa constrictor is? You know what that is? It's a, it's a huge, yeah, we're the lunch, but it's a, it's a huge uh, snake. Uh, here's a picture of an anaconda, which is a type of boa, and I believe possibly the dumbest human being that's ever lived is also in that photo. But, but uh, th these things can get 20, 30 feet long and weigh 500 pounds. So uh, who knows how boas eat? Do you know how they eat? With their mouth. They constrict, right? Yeah, with their mouth. But, but basically, once they find something they want to eat, they will wrap around it, and then they will constrict or tighten or squeeze its prey until all the life is gone from it. All the life is, is gone, and then... Uh, yeah, uh, what Rich said, then they just swallow you whole or it whole, whatever they're going to eat. So <clears throat> this giant constrictor, uh, you know, is, uh, is in the earth. And I believe the Bible teaches, now listen, because the, the Bible is the only one who, who, only source that really reveals this. But the Bible teaches that, is it coming through, honey? Yeah. All right. The Bible teaches that there's a spirit here, and he's like this boa constrictor spirit, and his, his whole goal is to just squeeze and choke and constrict and tighten around us until, until all the life of us is gone, until all our life's gone. But what he's really after, and this is what we want to talk about today, what the, what the spirit is really after, and no other source in the, in the world really even tells you about this spiritual enemy that we have. Is, is everybody wants to just act like he's not there or there is no such thing, but the Bible reveals there is this spiritual enemy and that we're the prey <laughs> of this spiritual enemy, that he's after us uh, and he seeks to devour us, the scriptures say. Uh, you know, we, we prefer, I mean, no, we prefer our, our devil, we prefer him to be a cartoon character, isn't that right? We're with the horns and the pitchfork and the pointy tail and the red suit. That's how everybody prefers their, their devil. It, it just let him be a cartoon character. And then, we, and then what it seems to happen is we just blame God for everything. But the scriptures do not say that at all. The scriptures say, number one, he's not a cartoon, <laughs> that he's real. And he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And that he is a... He's this giant boa constricting spirit that we're the prey and he does, chooses, he wants, he seeks to choke the life out of us. And what he's really after, listen, what he's really after is your love. He'll let you live if he can just choke the love out of you. That's what he's after, your spiritual enemy. He wants to just tighten and squeeze and constrict until there's no love left in you. I met a guy this week, or well, I passed a guy, I should say, this week that basically had no concept of neighbor and no love of neighbor left in his heart and in his life. And I was, I was going to uh, Dunkin' Donuts, all the Starbucks were closed, so I went by Dunkin' Donuts, but then I had to go to the, the shipping store a couple doors down from the Dunkin'. And so three times I passed this guy and he was in his own little world. You've, you've seen these guys. They're just talking to themselves constantly. They're in their own little world. And they don't even know another person. Talk about no love of neighbor. He had no awareness of neighbor. He didn't even know neighbor was in his world or in his life. His, his love had been completely choked out of him. Now, the scriptures call that possessed. We call it, today we'll call it mentally ill or insane. But the scriptures reveal that a spirit has completely choked this guy's life out of him, uh, and really his love out of him. He still had breath, but he had no concept of loving your neighbor. And so he was mumbling. Three times I passed him. And the third time, I actually heard what he said. And he was actually quoting the Bible. <laughs> I don't know if you know it, but these spirits, these fallen angels, they know the Bible. He was quoting the Bible. You know what he was saying? He was actually quoting this verse. Well, it's here some, somewhere. 
He's quoting this verse. Now this guy, now listen, he wasn't an evil, mean person. He wasn't threatening in any way. He, he, as a matter of fact, he wasn't connecting to anywhere, anyone in this world. He was just in his own world, completely devoid of any awareness or love of neighbor. And he was quoting these words, word, word for word. I'm using King James because this, he used King James. He said these words, word for word. How shall we escape if we neglect so great of salvation? That's what he was saying over and over and over. How shall we escape if we ne neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape? And he just said it over and over and over, very clear. I thought he was mumbling. He was very clear, saying these words very clearly. The spirit was consumed with his own doom, <laughs> his own doom coming. <laughs> look at, look at, uh, the verse before that, that was Hebrews 2, 3. The verse before that, verse 2, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience receives a just recompense of reward or, or it, it will receive a, a punishment. And then verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So the context is, is if words spoken by angels uh, saying there were going to be repercussions to to disobeying God, then how much more so that these words have been spoken to us by Jesus if we neglect his word, if we neglect his word. And so this spirit was consumed. He knew that his doom was coming <laughs> and he was consumed with it. But what I, my point about that is there was no love left in this person. He had no love, no connection with another human being. No even awareness of another human being. His love had been completely taken from him. Completely just constricted and tightened and squeezed until he had none left. And I'm submitting to you today, your spiritual enemy wants to do the same thing. He wants to kill love. There is an attack today on love. There is an attack, an assault on love. That's what you see in the world today. It is an attack on love. It's to get love out of the earth. Just like it was out of my Dunkin' Donuts guy, he, this spirit wants it out everywhere. It's an attack on love. And Jesus said, in the last days, which certainly were a lot closer to the end of days than when Jesus spoke these words, <clears throat> but Jesus said this war is going to be raging in the last days. And notice it's a war of love, a war on love, an assault on our love. Matthew 24, 12, Jesus is speaking. They said, what's the sign of the end? And then he, he teaches Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. You need to know those two chapters. If you don't know any other chapters in the Bible, you need to know Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 because we're living them and you're about to live the, the rest of them. Matthew 24, verse 12, sin will be rampant everywhere and notice what the attack is. The love of many will grow cold. The love of many. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to take place at the end time. The love of many will go, grow cold. Verse 10, two verses before that. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. Notice that. Many, not a few. Many will turn away, betray and hate each other. And many false prophets. Listen to that. Many false prophets will appear and will deceive people, many people. So, so at the end times, there's many false prophets speaking prophetically in, in the name of God. But they're deceiving many people. And the reason is because our love has grown cold. Just like my Dunkin' Donuts guy, his love had grown cold. I mean, completely cold, dead. And that's the... That's the goal of this enemy, is <clears throat> tribe and nation and brother against brother and tribe against tribe, nation against nation. It's, it's all for love. It's all to remove love. Everybody say, why? Why, why attack love? Why is, this, why is our enemy, this boa constrictor, evil spirit, trying to squeeze the love out of us, why is our enemy attacking love? Why would he attack love? Listen, you know the answer? Listen, because without love, we suffer. The human race suffers. Without love, 
The human race suffers. The world suffers. Just like this man, our, our man at Dunkin' Donuts. Without love, he was just tormented day and night, this guy. Tormented. Why? He had no love in his life. There was no love. He was consumed. Had no idea there was even another uh, neighbor person in the world. Consumed. And so our spiritual enemy, who most people don't even want to acknowledge, but our spiritual enemy, he attacks love. And the reason he attacks love is because he's here to steal, kill, and destroy. He knows that the human race will suffer without love. He knows that you will suffer without love. Every step you take out of love, you suffer. Almost instantly. Just try it today. Pick a fight with somebody. Get mad at them. Get angry. And see if you don't suffer. They may or may not suffer, but I guarantee you will. Because every step out of love, humans suffer. As a matter of fact, if you're suffering, you might want to check your love. <laughs> check your mercy. Check your love towards everyone. <laughs> because every step out of love, you lose part of your life. Your, your, your uh, blessing, your, your joy. All right. So the world suffers without love because, listen, love is the law. Everybody say law. Is the law of God. Now, what happens if you break man's law? If you get caught, you suffer, right? Isn't that right? If you want to test this out, when you leave here today, peel out and go about 60 or 80 till you get out of Ponce Inlet. And see, see if you won't suffer for it. Breaking... Breaking God's law. We've had people. Matter of fact, uh, one, one uh, 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 policeman was sitting in our, in our uh, parking lot this morning. But we've had people get tickets on the way to church. We had to call, we had to call the police chief. It's like, don't ticket our people coming to church. There's a whole town here to patrol. <laughs> but anyway, we know this for a fact. If you break God's law and, or, or break man's law and get caught, which which uh, many do, you will suffer. Well, you always get caught when you break God's law. If you break God's law, I'm submitting to you today, you will suffer. Nobody wants to hear that, just like nobody wants to hear there's a spiritual enemy, just like nobody wants to hear he's trying to kill, steal, kill, and destroy me. Nobody wants to hear that, but it's the truth. Just walk in love. <laughs> you don't want to suffer? Walk in love. You know? But you will. You break God's law, and you will Suffer. There are repercussions. There's consequences. And the man, mankind will suffer on a global scale, on a national scale, on a family scale, on a personal scale. Walk out of love and human beings suffer. So, of course, his goal then, this boa constricting spiritual enemy we have, his goal is to squeeze the love out of us because mankind will suffer. Just like he's suffering. Remember that, what he was saying, that spirit? He was saying... How shall we escape if we, he was, that spirit is suffering because he knows he's doomed. Tormented day and night for his bad choice. He made a bad choice and he's suffering forever for it. This is the reality we're talking about. So our spiritual enemy attacks love. He goes after love. And his goal is that we break the commandment of God so that we suffer. Now listen, here's an important part. His method has not changed. It started with Adam and Eve. His method is the same. It's always been. His method is to get you to question God's law and to get you to believe there's no repercussion or consequence to breaking God's law. And there's many false prophets who will tell you that. But the truth is, it's a law, and when you break it, you will suffer. That's the truth. Nobody wants to hear that, so the false prophets say, oh, there's no repercussion, there's no consequence, it's all good. And that's the original lie. Isn't that the original lie the serpent told Adam and Eve? Has God said? First he questioned the law, and then what was the next thing he said? You will not surely die. No repercussion, no consequence, no repercussion for breaking God's law. False prophets still tell you that today. The truth is, there is a repercussion. 
it happens instant and it's also gradual. It happened instant to Adam and Eve and it was also gradual. You will suffer for breaking the law. So the original lie is the same lie today. There's no repercussion. Just do the best you can. Well, you know, walk in love if you can, but God understands there's no repercussions, there's no consequence. Yes, there is. For every act, every step we take out of love, we are tormented. Why? Because there's a boa constricting evil spiritual enemy here. And that's his cue. <laughs> as soon as Adam and Eve broke God's command, he was right there. Steal, kill, and destroy. You won't, you won't surely die. There's no repercussions. Now today, I think it's even more subtle because today it comes, in, uh, comes across like this. God loves you. How many know God loves us? Haven't we been told that all our life? God loves us. The Bible tells us that. Jesus told us that. Everybody tells us that. God loves us. But if you think God loves you means there's no repercussion, you got the wrong definition of God loves you. Or God is good. We sing songs about how good he is. God is good. And he is good. The Bible says he's good. Jesus said he's good. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and, have, and more abundant. But if you think the fact that God loves you and that he is good means there's no repercussion for breaking his law, you're misunderstanding the truth. See, false prophets, they just tell you that part. They don't tell you about the repercussions. Can't earn salvation. Let's all say it together. Can't earn salvation. Now, I want to demonstrate this to you. Rich, I'm glad you're uh, still here. Every time I point to you, I want you to say nice, loud, and clear, can't earn salvation. Can't earn salvation. All right, let's practice. <laughs> I'm telling you, these phrases are codes for there's no repercussion in the back of our mind. God loves me. God is good. Can't earn salvation. And what we tell ourselves is there's no repercussion for breaking his law. And it's not true. You will suffer for breaking his law. And you already do. Your life has proven it. Step out of love and you suffer. Every single time. All right. Let me ask you this. Could Adam, think with me now, could Adam ever earn Eden? Can't earn salvation. <laughs> That's a hint. Could Adam ever earn salvation? No. Or could he ever earn Eden? No. Did God even require him to earn salvation? No, can't earn salvation. Oh, does anybody else want to do this with me? He's not even paying attention. <laughs> Tiernan, can you say it? Can you say can earn salvation? <laughs> did God even, listen, did God even ask Adam to earn the Garden of Eden? No, can't earn salvation. Quit ad libbing. Did God command him? Okay, why? Did God not require Adam to earn salvation? Can't earn salvation. You can't earn salvation. Why, didn't, why did God not require him to? Because you can't, earn. you can't earn salvation. Are we all agreed with that? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. Does the fact that you can't earn salvation mean there are no repercussions for breaking God's law? Are we all agreed that you can't, can't earn salvation? Are we all agreed with that? Does that mean, see how subtle that is? See, the Bible says the serpent is more subtle than all the, all the creatures. See how subtle that is? Can't earn salvation. And if you think can't earn salvation means uh, freedom from repercussion for breaking the law of God, 
you're misunderstanding what can earn salvation means. We're 100% agreement, you can't earn salvation. But does, does that even have any bearing on the truth that you will suffer repercussion and consequences for breaking God's law? Can't earn salvation has no bearing whatsoever on Adam having to obey the, the law and the command of God. Listen, folks, the law of God and the command of God has always been required to obey. We've always been required to obey it. We always will be required to obey it today and forever. The law of God can't be broken without consequence. Doesn't matter what wonderful phrases we say. God loves you. God is good. Can't earn salvation. Has no bearing. And when I imply it does have a bearing on consequence of breaking God's law, I'm a false prophet. I'm not telling people. I'm telling them just enough truth that they will appreciate and like me. I'm not telling them the truth. The, the full story. See, there is no Adam and Eve story where God said, oh, that's okay. I, you can't earn this anyway. I'm a good God and I love you. Just stay in the garden. That story don't exist. Only in our minds today does that exist. That story doesn't exist. Can't break God's law. Can't earn. All right, well, if you come to this church, you probably know the answer to this. What's God's commandment for us today? His commandment is not don't eat the apple, because he told Adam and Eve, don't eat the apple, because you're going to let the serpent into the world, and he's going to dominate and be the god of this world. So don't eat the apple. Well, the serpent's already here. So that rule, that rule's already been gone, broken. What's our commandment today? Jesus, I give you a hint. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. What's our commandment today? Love your neighbor. Love one another as I've loved you. Love. Love God. Love your neighbor. That's our commandment today. And I'm submitting to you, folks, you cannot break that commandment. I don't care how much God loves you. I don't care how good he is. I don't care how much you can't earn salvation that we all agree. You can't break that commandment. And not suffer repercussions. Instantly. And gradually. We just can't break the law of God. We can't break man's laws. We can't break God's law. We just can't. So this enemy spirit, he's after us. And the reason is he wants to choke our love out so that we'll suffer. Because if we break God's royal law of love, the command of love, we will suffer. The human race will suffer. You can look at the world. We, we constantly break God's law of love. So it's love, neighbor. Or suffer. So for the time we have remaining here, let's at least look at what love is. So I'm commanded to love. Let's talk a little bit about what it is. And we can't get into the whole thing today, but let's just pick a couple of things of, of what am I commanded to do. 1 Corinthians 13 is a chapter on love. And Paul, the first three verses, he says how important it is and how nothing else matters unless we do have love. And in verse 4, he begins to define the kind of love that we're commanded to keep, or we will be tormented. Love is patient and kind. If you're not patient, you will suffer in this world. I guarantee you, you just will. Tormented. Your mind, like my Dunkin' Donuts guy, your mind will be captured and tormented just from being impatient, because you're breaking the law of God. <laughs> and there's repercussion for that. Love, the law of love says, love is patient and kind. And then I'm just going to pick out one more. In verse 7, King Jem says, believes all things. Uh, other translation says, believes the best in all. Or, or uh, patient and kind to people, and believe the best about people. That's the three things we're 
going to say what love is today. And that love is more things, but it's these three. It includes these three. Patient, kind, and believe the best about people. If you're not patient and kind, and listen to this one. If you don't believe the best about people, just think about it in your own life. Think about people you're not believing the best about. And tell me if you don't suffer, if you're not tormented in your mind because of that. You've be- you got these people on your mind. You're not thinking the best of them. And you're tormented. You can't even sleep at night because you're tormented because of what they're doing. You're not thinking the best of them. You're not being patient with them. You're not being kind with them. You're not realizing that they're doing the best they can with the crazy mind they have. How many know that we all have this crazy mind? We're all doing the best we can. We have years and years of training and, and all kinds of influences, and, and we're doing the best we can with this thing. And the Bible says love believes that. It believes the best. And as soon as I take a step out of believing the best for somebody, believing that they're doing the best they can, as soon as I take a step out of that, I get tormented. I suffer. I don't care how crazy they are. I start suffering. Why? Because I start, and at that moment, am breaking God's law. Don't matter if they're breaking it. That's between them and God. I break it. When I take a step out of patience, when I take a step out of kindness, when I take a step out of believing the best about you, I start believing you're a little bit squirrely. Yeah. And then I suffer. You know what Jesus said? When you're unmerciful with somebody, do you remember the parable of the unforgiving debtor? When you're unmerciful with somebody, you go to torment. You go. (laughs) You're tormented for breaking the law of God. And Jesus said this, he said, you'll never get out unless you change, unless you repent, unless you start believing the best about them. They did the best they could. How many people are, do we have in our life where we're just holding on to these things because we're not believing they did the best they could? We either are patient and kind and believing the best, or we get delivered to the tormentor. We're breaking God's law. And there's no no variableness here, folks. There's no uh, wiggle room. You break God's law, there's repercussions. False prophets tell you, "Ah, you know, just do the best you can. There's no, no, that's not true. Break it and suffer. That's the truth. Every single time, every area of your life, we are not being patient, kind, and, and, and loving, and believing the best about people, you're suffering. Every area, with every relationship, every person. Every time, all day, every day, forever, if you don't change. That's what Jesus said, deliver to the tormentor, and you won't get out. No exceptions. <clears throat> now, I've learned this, that... <laughs> What this love means, being patient and kind and, and uh, believing the best of people, is, is God really wants us to do this with crazy people. Everybody say crazy people. Crazy people. There's crazy people in the world. And, and I, learned this at, I learned this at North Street. I started going down there, you know, and, and for five years we went down there and, and every week just interacting with crazy people. They were literally just doing things that I thought was crazy. They were living a life that I thought was crazy. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go help these folks. I'm going to go straighten them out. I'm going to go give them some scripture and tell them what they're doing wrong and kind of straighten them out. I'm going to go really fix them. And after five years, what I realized is God sent me there to fix me. He wanted to show me how different my conditional love is was from his regular, normal love and how different I was, how judgmental I was. He showed me me with those people. I'm convinced of this. God desires that we take care and concern for the poor because he wants to fix our love. Our love's not too good. 
So you, you practice it. You improve it when you love the least among us. It, it practices your love. You get better. You get better at God's kind of love. You get less judgmental. You love the crazy people, as I say. You just love them. You realize, I'm crazy too, just in different ways. I break God's laws too. Almost done. Thanks for staying with me. My care for the poor heals me. It may or may not help them, but it always heals me. It heals my love. It shows me the deficiencies in my love. The last one is I now find myself in this world, new world that we live in, I now find myself in a real small minority. I'm in a real small minority. I'm, I'm a human being that don't wear a mask unless I'm forced to and told to. So what I do, I have my mask and I just put it on my chin so that they think I'm one of them. And I just put it on my chin and I go about my business and I go in stores and I do whatever I do. And the only time I put it up over my mouth is if somebody stops me and says, you got to have that on. And I'll put it up over my mouth, but I'll still leave my nose free. And the only time I'll cover my nose is if I get caught a second time. So I now feel like I'm like one out of a thousand because I look at the world and I go in stores and I shop and I would say out of a thousand people, one doesn't have a mask. That's me. The, I guess the non-mask wearers are just staying home. But, and then I see an article that says, if you don't wear a mask, you're a narcissist and a psychopath and antisocial and you're a very bad person. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that about myself. I, I thought I was okay. I thought I was practicing love. But I don't, wear, I don't wear a mask. So I just wanted to share with you, my bottom line is, whether you wear a mask or not, you're supposed to love the other side. You get that? You're supposed to love the other side. Love the crazy people, whichever side you think is crazy. Thousand to one people think I'm crazy. But I, just, I at least wanted to give you two reasons. Number one, here's, here's the one reason I don't wear a mask, is number one, this, the, the virus that's raging the world right now is only transmitted by particles. It's not in the air. You realize that, right? It's not airborne. It's not floating in the air like everybody... I don't really care, really. You can wrap yourself in cellophane and poke a little hole with a straw out. It wouldn't bother me. I'm still commanded to love you. All I'm saying is, it's not airborne. You don't have to have a mask walking the beach. You don't have to have a mask every second you go out the door. It's not airborne. Where, you're, where you run risk is, if you get close enough to somebody and they cough on you or sneeze on you, that's where the virus is. It's in the droplets. So, yeah, there's a virus raging. It's not the first time in history. We've had many of them in my lifetime. We've never done this with any of the other ones. We all survived somehow, or the world survived somehow. So it's not airborne. It's in particles. So you've got to be aware of that. Protect yourself and others. And the second thing is, up until five months ago, all the experts in all the history of the world said don't wear masks if you're healthy. Up until five months ago. Now, listen to the world we live in. You can't find that information. You can't find the studies. You can't find the articles. You can't find anything. That's now on page 100 of Google search. They have put that information as far away from humans, they know nobody will go past page two. How many of you have ever went to page two on Google search? <laughs> so if they put it at page 100, it's never getting discovered ever again. So those are just the two things. You can wear them all day long if you want. Just be comfortable. And all I'm saying, my only point is, just love your neighbor. Amen. Don't let this evil spirit get us fighting each other. You know, you know, the, that people look at me and they think, I'm an evil, you know, disease-carrying killer. That's the looks you get, you know. Like yeah, yeah, a modern-day leper. And, and that's okay. But I need to love them. I need to love people. 
whichever side that I happen to fall on, whether I'm in, in the line at North Street or serving at North Street, or I'm wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, the, 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 the goal of our spiritual enemy is to choke the life and the love out of us. I'm not going to let that happen. I don't care how bad you think of a person you think I am. I'm going to love you. I'm not letting him win this spirit. All right, so in conclusion, in closing, let's read this scripture. Don't let him win, folks. Just practice love, increase love. Look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. It's increasing, abounding, and becoming greater. The love of God can just continue to grow in us. Just increase, get better, abound. We don't have to let this crazy world and all the things going on in this world, crazy people in the world, whoever we think that is, which one side or the other, doesn't matter. The commandment is to love our neighbor. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's thank uh, Facebook for joining us today.